Okay, I think we're going to get started here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for Wishes or Woes. Santa, or Ethan, Santa Edwards knows how to help. Um, we're excited to share many of the letters that we received on your learning wishes and woes. So thank you so much for everybody that submitted those. Um, so with us is obviously Santa, Ethan Edwards. He's Chief Instructional Strategist here at Allen Interactions. Lisa Pingle Stortsickle, his trusty elf, um, is going to be here today helping share the letters and advice with Santa. And um, she's Strategic Relationship Manager here at Allen as well. And then also here is myself, uh, Carrie Zenz, Carrie Blip Zenz, sorry, and uh, Brittany Dasher here. We'll be providing um, back channel support today. Um, so happy holidays to everybody out there. And before we get started and pass things over to Santa and to Lisa Pingle, we are going to just go over a few housekeeping items. We can see the control panel. Well, let slide. me back up just a second so you can see oh. my assistants here. <laughs> there's, there's Blitzen and Dasher. They're there to help. There's tr trusty elves. Okay. Yeah, the, um, so this is your control panel. This is where you have control of your audio with your telephone and mic and speakers. So you can choose the telephone, your landline, or the mic and speakers of your computer. Um, and then if you choose telephone, then it, it'll provide the, the telephone information there on your control panel. And then to collapse and expand your control panel, you use that orange square with the white arrow in it. And this is also where you submit any questions you have throughout the hour to us. So feel free to, to submit questions as we're going along, and we'll try to get some of those answered right when they're, right when they're asked. Okay, and then next, um, just want to know if you want to, uh, Dasher here is going to be sh sharing the, the webinar chair through Twitter. So if you want to follow that, follow along with that and share anything else with Twitter, if you're a tweeter, then please use the hashtag eLearning Santa, and you can follow us on Interactions at Custom eLearning. And then as always, we are recording today's webinar, and we'll be sending out a link to the recording um, most likely tomorrow. So this will be recorded and sent out to everybody. And with that, I wanted to turn things over to Santa Edwards and to Lisa Pingle to get things rolling and to start covering these letters and giving you advice. Perfect. So here's our first letter, Santa. Dear Santa, how do I start my e-learning programs with fun hooks to engage the audience, explaining the course's overview without putting learners to sleep? Sign, Sharon. Well, that's a big, good question, Sharon. It's one of the biggest problems that little boys and girls have in building their e-learning is how to keep people interested. You know, and what are the some of the things that we've been taught to do just are wrong, or well. My, Maybe not so wrong, but they, they really don't grab people's attention. Like starting out with a list of the boring objectives. And it isn't that you don't want to give the objectives, but you need to do it in a way that makes sense to your learner, that really connects. Because there's nothing worse than somebody opening up a lesson and being bombarded with a lot of stuff that doesn't feel like it's interesting or relevant. Um, so one thing to do is, is to look at your content and say, what's the most interesting thing about this? What would be the most fascinating or um, impactful way to grab somebody's attention. And to do that, you really have to understand your content, and you have to understand your users. And oftentimes, it isn't so much telling what the content is, but instead telling what the consequences of not learning this material is. I've got an example that was um, in somebody's stocking last year that really shows us well. and um, it was done for a mass transit district in um, South Dakota. And they wanted to be as good of citizens as they could. And one of the things that they do is they have um, people in wheelchairs and other um, um, limited accessibility sort of situations that need to um, be moved safely through town. And instead of just telling their drivers sort of these, this is what the rule is, they came up with an introduction that sort of, sort of gets right to the point that people will remember. Um, there is audio, but it probably is not going to be able to hear it because of um, the way our North Pole connection is um, and the way this works. But you can see how it's going to be just by paying attention to these slides. OK, so um, it begins with, 
not the content so much as well, it needs a load to get, to get its way through the snow. Thomas bags. Avery suffered the misfortune of a terrible automobile accident that left him a C4 quadriplegic. However, this did not stop him from finishing college and excelling in his field of computer-aided drafting. He also volunteered with at-risk children in two different school programs. Then, it's on April 12, 2008, right. Mr. Avery was being loaded into a bus by the owner and vehicle operator Come of on. MV Transportation. The driver made several critical mistakes, Here we including go. skipping a proper inspection of the lift, parking the bus on a steeply sloped hill, and failing to use the occupant restraint belt. Mr. Avery's chair rolled off the lift, crashing him to the ground, causing severe brain injury. A jury awarded $6.4 million. I'm not sure if all you little boys and girls can hear the narration, but it's sort of adding commentary there. But the, these images and the messages are about you know, what, how, how serious this topic is. And, and, you know, this thing I like a lot. You know, that it's really put in Santa, the sound's coming through loud and clear. And Santa, we can hold and hear the sound. Okay, good. Accidents like this can be prevented. Prevented by you. To keep passengers safe and at ease while in your care, you must focus on four skill areas, represented by four modules in this course. You must know and follow the best practices for the common wheelchair securement, picking up and loading passengers, securing the chair to your vehicle, and deboarding your passenger. Beyond the physical steps necessary to secure a passenger in your vehicle, remember that the most important aspect of this process is respect. The riders entrusted to your care depend on you for their safety and also their dignity. Show you respect them by learning how to protect them. Return to the main menu and launch the next module titled Boarding Guidelines. Okay, so I hope you, you felt how um, powerful that was. And I think what's really great about it is it's visual. You get a lot out of it through the impact of the media. And it appeals to the learner's sense of purpose and their emotions. And that kind of thing really can take what otherwise could be really tedious content and make it into something that people are eager to to um, to pay attention to. Lisa Pingle, you want to add anything to that? No, that was just such a sad story, Santa. Oh, I know, but it isn't it great to realize that these learners could know that they can prevent something like happening and that that's really tied directly to their training. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so you know, we have some gifts for you that you can collect after the you come through the Allen Interactions website. One of those is a white paper about motivation, and, and partly this how you introduce content and how you keep people engaged is all about motivation. And so, if you're interested in more details of that, you can go and download the, our motivation white paper, and it'll talk about that issue and some other ways to um, avoid that really boring um, way of of presenting content we all feel so stuck with. Thanks so much, okay. Santa. We have a great letter from Jennifer, who's super creative. Dear Santa, my creativity used to shine and twinkle like lights on a Christmas tree. Ideas would leap out of my head like flying reindeer. Please fill my stocking full of creative ideas to help me create meaningful and engaging learning for all that rely on me. Signed, Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer, do you have great uh, goals and aspirations, and I want to help you. The thing is to remember that you know that creativity is still there, and what we often do is we get lost in the um, the demands of of our time frames, and we just don't give ourselves the freedom to to, to think. What um what I'd like you to think about is um, that there are things you can do when you're designing that are really critical for making your creative juices flow. And these are some of those that I think are really important. Um, and, and if you don't do these, it is hard to, it's easy to get stuck in a rut. You know, one, don't start with story, storyboards. Storyboards are an awful good way to document boring things. Um, but they're not a very good way to figure out creative ideas. And instead, you want to use prototypes and sketches. All, you know, think visually. Um, don't do anything that's so detail-oriented. Get a whiteboard and, and sketch ideas. And even if you're working on your own, it really helps to sketch things out. And then bring one of your coworkers in and just say, what do you think of this idea? Because it's really, it's really hard to be creative when you don't have somebody else even to converse about. 
but but doing prototypes as trials is a great way to be creative. You know, and don't work linearly. Oftentimes, I see people just jumping in and saying, "Well, I got to start at the beginning." Well, oftentimes, the most interesting stuff is at the end, and we get stuck um, with um, with our boring stuff. And, and by the time we're ready to be creative, we're just worn out. Um, another thing, and this is going to seem sort of funny because Santa thinks that good readers are really good children and need to develop that, but Sometimes your learners are a little naughty, and they don't want to read everything. And one way to be creative is to pretend that you can't, that your learners can't read. And that's going to force you to think really visually and think of interactions that make intuitive sense. And those are the kind of things that really spark creativity. And then also, um, seek input early, which means ask people if you're on the right track. Because um, sometimes we get wed to ideas too early, because you know we thought of it, so we think it's a really great idea, and yet we didn't have a chance to test it. And so th those are some of the things that we use here in the North Pole to be a lot more creative in how we put things together. Now, as a little example of that, of um, sort of a an unexpected way that um, some content that could otherwise have been really pretty tedious was made creative. This is some work that was done for a, a company that deals with distribution systems. Um, and they have the issue of teaching people you know, how they warehouse items. And what's really cool about this, it, it shows people sort of the problem and let some experience it, and then sees a, a better way to do it and challenges a learner to be good about it. So one of the tasks here is when you're downloading, when you're unloading pallets, things have to get to the right spot. And so our challenge here is we've got three pallets, and we've got things we're unloading from this truck, and I've got to do the tedious job of looking through the list and seeing, okay, is this belong on pallet A? And we have to see the CCC. It's not on that list, so let's look on the second one. There we go. You know, Lisa Pingle, this is sort of like checking our list for who's been naughty and, and nice, but it gets really time consuming, but okay, this is on pallet D, so we need to put that over there. And here's another one. This is uh, also on pallet D. We'll put that there. And here's one. We got to look for PR five four five six. That's also pallet D. Wow, everything's on pallet D. CH three eight nine four. So you can see how. This is a really tedious job, but it's, it's really important that it be done carefully and with echoes on pallet C and with quite a bit of thought. But you know, if your business was running this way, you wouldn't have very many efficiencies, I think. Um, I want to get through this one to show you how cool this becomes to illustrate the power of technology. Because now that we've experienced the slow way of doing this, there, that goes on pallet B. So we got six out of six. We did really good. Um, but what if we moved that pace? And so here is introducing the idea that there's technology that can make this so much easier and not um, end up with errors. So instead, the way their distribution works is you actually scan these, and it tells you where to go. And, and we have a time um, challenge to see how much quicker this is. And if you don't get it done quite fast enough, you have to go back and do it some more. But it's it's really trying to give you a a um, powerful way to see how you can be a good worker in this distribution and how your choices can make a difference. So I think that's a that really is, cool, creative application. What do you think, Lisa? I think that is so cool, and I think we should get more of those in our workshop, too. Because Donner, he's not quite getting those orders out on time. I know. Some of those toys get put in the wrong batch, and we get them in the wrong households, and little boys get sad when that happens. Okay, so anyway, your gift um, is there's a, um, another white paper you can go to the Allen Interactions website. Our friends there have these tools ready for you. And it's a white paper about the five design activities for creating impactful e-learning. And I think they'll really help um, you think about ways to be more creative in that design phase of, of creating e-learning. 
exciting, Santa. Thank you for those gifts. And as a reminder, we're putting all those white paper. We'll um, put out the site at the end and putting it in the windows, too, so you know where to get all the extra information. So here's a great letter from Erica. Dear Santa, any words of advice for shaping a no course into a do course? We have a serious case of they just need to know it blues over here and a lot of content that doesn't have a real life application for 99% of the people taking the course. Sign Erica. And Santa, your last example was a great example too of a do versus a no. That's right because you could easily have just told people about it and not had a sense of what do you do with this information. And you know that's so much what is important when you're doing training is to get people applying that. And I think it's Sometimes it's an easy way out that, that we take because we think, well, this is just, they just need to know it and I can't do anything but tell it to them. But, you know, if we remember that people don't read very well online, if they don't have a purpose, it's not going to have much impact. And so one of the things you need to do is just really figure out how to create a challenge. That is a reason for the learner to be paying attention and trying to solve a problem. We had some friends at um, a company called GTech, and they they were faced with this problem. And I want to show you how they solved it because I think they were really really clever. Um, they had this problem that they were they had um, well what this company does is they do a lot of scientific stuff about lottery systems for the states and so forth. So you can believe that the the government is very interested to make sure that they are doing everything right. And so they have some regulations that they have to prove every year that everybody who works at this company has been through some awareness training. That's sort of like what you were saying, Erica, about they just need to know something. And awareness training is another one of those sort of cop-outs to say, well, I don't know why we're training this, but people need to be aware of it. Well, this is a case where they really needed to prove that people had some exposure, but they there weren't really tasks associated with it. But what they did is they made a puzzle out of this. So here's, we're going to go and look at this part called the control room security threats. And so instead of talking about what are the threats to security, it actually put the user into a, a, a virtual control room. And there's all sorts of things we can see, and your task is to look around this room and find, identify things that you think are threats to the security of the data. Now we can look around and see that, oh, there's somebody's putting a CD into this machine. Um, and so I can identify that by taking the magnifying glass and I move it and I drop it on that thing which I think is a problem. And when I identify it, I get that information. This is what you know, I need to be aware of. This is the no information. But it's only given to me after I've done something and I've already sort of figured out, you know, it's a problem if users are putting their own software onto the company machines. And indeed, you know, it's a problem introducing viruses and it tells why that's a problem. Now, when I identify it, it fixes a problem. That gets added to my list of potential risks. Gee, Lisa, we have a lot of lists. It's just like our list of who's good and bad, isn't it? It's hard to keep track of. But as I keep working on this, I keep thinking, how what might be some other problems? And here's some papers sitting on the printer, and those could have secrets on it that you don't want other people to see. So I'll go and identify that. And it tells me, yep, indeed, that the proprietary information is something that should be protected. And so in this one little interaction, it's become a vehicle for delivering all that need-to-know content, but the focus is on the learners thinking about it and, and, and processing what are the risks and thinking through that so that when the information is given, like here's a naughty man who looks like he's doing up to no good. Let's see what, I think that's a problem. Yep, so unescorted guess. And each time my thinking is confirmed um, and it's that challenge, it's that, that pursuit of a problem that makes the learner think about it and really take something out of this as opposed to what otherwise could just be eight pages of deadly dull information that nobody paying any attention to. 
Santa, wouldn't it be great if we had that magic magnifying glass for uh, the Grinch in Whoville and we could wipe everybody out like that? That would be really great that we could just look. But, you know, I sort of can do that because I know who's naughty and nice. I can't tell how my secret is, but it's like, <laughs> a magnifying, it's like a cool magnifying glass just like that. Do you have a gift for us again, Santa? I think I might have a gift. Let me look in my bag and see what we could come up with. Yeah, I, we have another white paper called Seven Steps to Improved E-Learning Challenges. And there's actually a webinar that goes along with that that you probably can get access to. Um, again, this is all on the Allen Interactions website. But you know, the thinking that led to creating that challenge, making that content that is just like um, um, boring information to be delivered, this white paper is really cool because it goes and does very simple steps from starting from a very telling um, sort of way of questioning. And with the tiny steps, it takes you from that to a final interaction that really feels like you're doing something, and yet it's still delivering the same content. So I, I think that's another really good gift that you can you should study and think about applying. That's great, Santa. Yep, boring is bad. So dear Santa, please help. I have to develop highly technical e-learning and I don't want to use the typical matching, true, false, or multiple choice knowledge checks as ways to see if they get it. Signed, Linda. And Dan, I think this applies to not only highly technical e-learning, but pretty much all e-learning. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, the pro it's partly a problem with the tools that you have to work with. Um, so many of the authoring tools that, that are available, they're set up to suggest that that's really all you're supposed to do. That that's that whenever you ask a question, it's one of those those formats, and it's really hard as a new person to figure out different ways to ask those questions. And so, one of the first things you need to do is figure out that you're not a victim of, of your authoring system; that you can use it to do what you want. And then, the, one of the things that is most missing about you know those typical matching and true/false and multiple-choice questions is that they don't have any meaningful context. Um, they're just looking like you're answering a question out of a textbook or out of like a nasty SAT question and nobody likes doing that and so we sort of get stuck but you know the thing that you want to keep in mind and I don't mean this as bad news but it sort of sounds like it is all you can really build in e-learning is multiple choice questions because that's how the computer sort of sets up the options and gives lets us give feedback and so your trick to get out of that is not so thinking, thinking so much about the different question, but thinking about how you can create an interesting context so that it appears that the learner is buried in something that is really fascinating. You can do this at all sorts of levels. I've got two, two examples I want to share with you about how this can change your, your, um, the tediousness of your e-learning. The first one is just a little picture here to show you a solution that came up. And this was done for William Sonoma. You know, if you're looking for some gifts for your own um, families, this is a great place to get good Christmas things. I love going on, the, in, on my own time and looking at some of the cooking supplies. But anyway, one of the things they were doing is training new employees about sort of the traditions and the heritage of where their um, company message came from. And part of the thing was that their founder had gone to France <clears throat> and had realized there were all sorts of really specialized uh, kitchen uh, equipment that Americans were not, t didn't have access to. And so what he did is he collected some of those more unusual things and brought them back and really used that as the core product for the, starting this really great um, kitchen company. So you could imagine that they could have, you could have really very typical multiple choice questions of what items did um, did Chuck bring back from Paris? Was it a salt shaker? Was it a cheese grater? And so forth. And by the time you get checking all of those, you get really bored and they'd be sort of tedious questions. But here, this is what your task is: is you're you've got his suitcase right down here in the lower right hand corner, and you get to collect those things in the suitcase that were part of that initial collection. 
And so it's still sort of a multiple choice question. You're matching items, but it doesn't feel like it because it doesn't look like an academic question. Not A, B, C, and D labels, and the and your gestures aren't answering questions, but doing something. You're collecting these items. So I'm sorry I can't show it to you, but in the real piece you can drag like this salt, this fancy pepper grinder. I can drag that right into the suitcase. If I do something really ordinary like the cheese grater, it doesn't let me keep that there. But the, really that's just using context to make something that is still pretty straightforward feel very interesting and feel like you're accomplishing something. So that's a really important idea. Um, hey, Santa, speaking of Williams-Sonoma, we got lots of letters that want to know what your favorite kind of cookies are. Oh, um, I like all kinds of cookies, but I really <laughs> like shortbread. <laughs> shortbread cookies are really good. <laughs> um, another um, example here to show how great context is for transforming something, this is um, back to the example we looked at a moment ago. Um, about securing wheelchairs. And um, after that introduction, he gives some guidelines and so forth. But one really interesting part is about how to secure the chair. And you could imagine that there are rules about how, um, you know, exactly where you can place the wheelchair in the bus and how the, the restraint straps need to be anchored carefully and so forth. And again, you could talk about it without having a real sense of how that works. And what they did here is they really use context um, to make it feel like you're doing this task, even though it's really just a series of multiple choice questions. But first, we have to see what kind of bus we have. I like this one that has one track securement. And then we need to um, pick our equipment. Now, one thing that's also cool about here, this, and some people get nervous about, is that notice that we're just starting and doing something. And you might not know exactly how many pieces, how many different straps you need. Well, instead of telling everybody that, I can go out and look for guidelines for secure And here's a really good reference that I can go and hunt for information that I don't know. And so this really is a great way when you have an audience that has variable background, um, that you let it up to each user to decide, how much do I want to read about this before I start doing it? And you know, some, some boys and girls really feel different about jumping in and trying something. And nothing's more frustrating than if you want to try something and you're sitting here reading 20 pages of text. But also some, some boys and girls like to really do the research so they know what they're doing right. And so we need to figure out ways that we can accommodate both of those types. But at any rate, you can see here that it tells me exactly what I need to know about how much gear is required. So I'm trying to go back and I'm going to say I need four of these um, straps for this situation. And now I'm going to have to try to use those straps and actually um, anchor this gentleman in, safely into my bus. But notice this feels very interactive in that you know, I can drag these restraints wherever I want. But notice there's really just four choices right now. I could decide which one of these four tracks would be the place to, to attach this. So that, you know, that's one of those boring multiple choice questions, but it doesn't feel that way at all because I'm um, actually making a real task. And now my next thing is, where would I anchor this onto the wheelchair? Would I do it on the wheel? Well, no, that's not a good answer. Um, maybe down here. Okay, I can put it down low. That's not a good choice. But notice that even though this feels like I've got really, uh, I could do anything, it's got a number of choices and there's only really one good place to anchor that. And so it, it really is a series of multiple choice questions made very interesting by the context. And so I can go and switch around and put one of these in the back. And what's really cool about this, I think, is not only am I learning the content, but I'm getting a real good sense of what it would take in the when I'm dealing with a actual wheelchair and an actual patient of getting um, getting everything safely and secure before I can get going on my our trip. More fun to be able to do than just know. It just it's so it looks so boring to just read all that, but it's so fun to do it. You know, we had a few questions come in. 
Can you hear them? They're coming in. The reindeer are bringing in a question. Here it comes. A couple of people are asking. Okay. You know, <laughs> it looks like we have a lot of good media, um, and they're wondering if they don't have a media artist, what are some of the creative ways they can do media? Well, um, I think you're, you're noticing something that's really important, and that is that you know, e-learning is really in its strongest point a visual medium. And if you don't pay attention to how it looks and how you're representing things, um, you're going to have you're going to really fall short of what what's, what's possible. Um, I can't. I, I can't. I attach. know some of our yeah. yeah some of our friends at the South Pole. They actually um, use. They found a lot of technical colleges in their community, and so they oh. just get people, interns and things, to come over and help them out for free because the kids need um, items for their portfolios. Yeah, that's a really great way to get help because there's kids that are really talented and they're very eager to have some experience. And so if you set up an internship or some kind of a partnership, you can get a lot of help that way. There also are sources of good graphics online, um, like I, um, iStock Photo and, and some other things like that that you can go out and get them. What I do think, even if you're not a graphic artist, that you can't really, maybe you don't feel comfortable drawing things from scratch, a skill that I think you should work on that becomes very valuable is just being able to at least process some images. So like you get a photograph, and you could use a tool like Fireworks or Photoshop or something that you could trim it, you could make it a little different size, you could turn it. Because those kind of things, you don't want to rely on somebody else to have to make every little change. And so even though it maybe seems like something you're not comfortable with, it's one of those things that I think you'll, in the long run you'll really benefit from if you, if you can just become a little bit skilled at even just manipulating graphics. But one thing I hope that this, uh, this um, illustration shows, um, and what I was going to say is Santa can't do this interaction and talk at the same time. I'm stuck here, um, is that, there we go, you know, these graphics are not like super sophisticated 3D images that somebody spent just a fortune on. And you could imagine, I, and you know, some people pursue that and have models that show people rotating. And I hope you can see that even well-executed, simple graphics are often better. You know, and this is really a very simple cartoon and yet it allows us to do everything we need to do to teach this, whereas you could have worried very much about making it look like textured um, images and 3D and like what, what material is his shirt made out of and his hair needs to look like hair and all those kind of things that I find people worrying about. And oftentimes that doesn't make the difference between the interaction working and not. Um, you know, have faith in simplicity as you come up with these graphics. Perfect. Santa, I think you have a gift for us that the Grinch helped you wrote. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, the Grinch can sometimes be a helpful friend. And that is, you know, the problem is that your initial question was about how to prevent things from getting so um, tedious is really because we do things that we shouldn't, um, but they're really accepted. And so there's another white paper that I think you might find interesting called 10 Ways to Ruin Your E-Learning, which it goes through all the things that people suggest you should do, but really lead you down the wrong path. And so um, in the backwards way, it's hoping that you're going to do some, some of those, you're going to stop doing some of those typical things that uh, sort of lead us down the wrong path. Okay, I bet we have another letter here. We do. And this one's from Jody. Dear Santa, I really enjoy creating effective e-learning, but it is one of the many, many tasks and always has to get pushed back when I'm asked to prioritize something else. Any really quick tips on using e-learning creation tools that may be able to help me? Signed, Jody. And Santa, just so you know, the um, reindeer just brought in lots more questions. People are asking what some of the demos are developed in and all the different tools that might be out there. Okay. Well, that's a really great question. And you know, I think it's one of the hardest things as someone doing e-learning has to face, and we have to use some tool. Now, many of the examples that you've looked at have been either programmed in Flash, which is a tool that's really powerful, but it's hard to use. Um, some are in Zebra, and you'll see a few more. Zebra's apps is a 
a tool that my friends at Allen Interactions are um, have created. We'll talk about more about that in a minute. Um, there are some other tools that you're probably familiar with. We don't use um, quite as often, although we certainly do use them for some projects. I don't have them as part of the demos, and that is, you know, things like articulate storyline, captivate lectora, and so forth. Now. The problem is, how do you get to become a master of using those tools? Because they're pretty hard to use. And what they make easy to you do are a lot of things you don't want to do anyway. Like they optimize it so that you can put a PowerPoint presentation into your e-learning right away. And then how you can ask some not very interesting questions. And so what you really want is to figure out how you can get all that stuff out of the way. So if you're using one of those standard tools, what I really would request that you you really try to throw away the the things that they tell you to do and make sure that you can do what you want to do. And if you're not quite sure what that means, just pick a couple examples that are out of the ordinary and say, I'm going to try to build this. Because if you don't open your eyes to widen it, you're not going to get there. But what I do want to say is if you're just starting out, I think one of the best, and you're um, and you're able to make some decisions about what tools you want to use, it, the, you know, the use of Zebra's apps is one that I think is you really should take a look at because what's different about it than the other tools is that the, of primary importance is making it easy for the learner to do interesting things rather than and and what you find out is then you can do things really fast. You know, like, when I've seen people do comparable work in Zebra's apps versus doing it even in Flash, it's like a tenth as, as, as much time it takes. Um, and so it's a little different because it, it's taking a different model than all those other ones, but that's because those other models don't make it very easy to do things quick. And so if you're interested in that, as a gift, there are some free trials available um, and a training series coming from in January. I would really encourage you to look at if you are interested in trying to figure out how could I do something sort of like that that wheelchair example or you know that um, warehousing thing that would be really pretty hard to do in some other tools. Those are a snap to do in Zebra's apps, and so I would really encourage you to look um, look at that as a way to shorten that development time. going to show the card in Zebra. Do you have time for that? Oh, yeah. But actually, here's something I, we won't spend too much time right now, but I really encourage you to go here because if you're worried, well, if it's so easy, is it? can you do sort of things that are, are interesting? Well, here's a greeting card that was built entirely in Zebra um, in a very short amount of time. And some of you may have been familiar with the conversation model that Allen Interactions has used and perfected over the years. It's such a great way to talk, teach people how to do sales calls or how to you know, negotiate things. And this is a fun little interaction you might want to look at about negotiating what Santa's giving you if you're getting a call and talking about that. Um, this is a, Lisa Fingal, isn't this available if they go to the Zebra's App Store and look for an application? I think um, Dasher is going to put a link in the chat room. Absolutely. And Santa, this is the exact same training we use to train all your helper Santas, all the Santas we put in the malls around the world to help this time of year. This is how we got them all to do oh, Santa speak. Okay, well I was wondering who this guy was because <laughs> he looks Perfect. like he's trying to impersonate me. Yeah, he doesn't look very, he's not a happy Santa like you are. Yeah. But, so Santa, you know, there if, were... But if you, if you're in, if you see this, um, you can contact the folks at Allen Interactions, and they can help explain how straightforward it is to use Zebra to put something intricate like this together. Perfect. Santa, we got so many letters about everybody okay. trying to wrangle in their SMEs, and I know you have the same problem trying to wrangle in all our crazy reindeer friends. So let me just give you a few SME letters that we got in. Uh -huh. Dear Santa, this year for Christmas, may I please have SMEs who meet their deadlines and stakeholders who recognize they are part of the process but do not drive the bus and can look beyond their personal pet project and see there are many things to be done for others too. That's signed by Jean. Another one, Dear Santa, 
I would like for SNEEZ to leave instructional design to instructional designers. Signed, oh, Bobby. And we got a lot of those, Bobby. And this one's from Zulma. Dear Santa, please shine Rudolph's bright nose on me and my SNEEZ to help increase my bright ideas as I continue to develop courseware. Also, give SNEEZ the gift of active listening skills and quick response so that I can continue to, little, to deliver projects on time while lowering my blood pressure. On a side note, have Dancer and Prancer throw a few sprinkles toward my significant other. He needs a lot of help in the dance department, and I really want to dance my way into the new year. Signed, Zulma. Uh -oh. Big oh, order, Santa. Yeah, indeed. Now, about Sneeze, it's hard to work with um, Sneeze, partly because of the structure of traditional learning departments doesn't facilitate you know, having a chance to creative, creatively work on a new and innovative way to teach something. And that's sort of what has to happen with e-learning. So partly, the SMEs aren't used to the new, new demands. And one thing, and I don't want this to sound too simplistic, but I think it really is critical, is that we need to quit thinking of it as us versus them and really start thinking of a team approach to developing e-learning, because your SMEs have to be part of that team. Um, and what you can find is that by sharing the responsibility and working early together on some of the design ideas, you're going to end up with a lot more cooperation. Um, some of the things you need to do, though, is you know guide them a bit into understanding interactivity, but again, not at so much as a sense of adversarial, but as um, cohorts in trying to solve that problem. And you know, we're going to talk about, I think in, there's going to be some letters about something called SAM a little bit later, and that's really all about how you can start initiating your projects in a way that build cooperation right from the very beginning and, and common understanding with your SMEs rather than you being a passive recipient of whatever the SMEs dumping on you. So it's a cultural shift that has to take place. Now, I do have a little something for that second question um, about your partner in dancing. Before you go to that, I'm sorry, Santa. Yeah. Um, we had a couple questions come in, and I apologize because we used in the letter we used um, SME or SMEs, and we have some global partners around the world, and apparently that is not a term familiar with them. So it, it does oh. indeed mean subject matter expert. Yes. Um, so it's usually the person who is the authority of the content. And the thing that the challenge is, those people usually have been experts for many, many, many years, and they are very proud of what they know and have somehow sometimes have forgotten what it's like for a new person to be starting out in a field. And the biggest risk often is that they're overpowering a new learner with too much information. And that's where the role of the instructional designer can be to help to filter that to the right level for a new user. Um, but I do have a little bit of um, something I hope will help your, your um, in the dance department. And this is a little zebra zap I want to share with you. Roll, wind up your Victrola, and here he goes. Me and Mrs. Claus have foxtrotted a lot based on these instructions. So this is something you could build. Um, in about 10 minutes in Zebra's apps, and it'll help your partner know how to dance. And I'm okay. sure Zulma will love that. Yeah. That is fabulous. Okay, what is, then let's... Um, yep, and we have about 10 minutes left, Santa, so we're going to move on to another letter. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. There we go. With the little background music. <laughs> I'm trying to get the... Here's Santa. trying to get the Foxtrot music. <laughs> okay, there we go. Dear Santa, I peeked up my presents in the hiding place under my mom and dad's bed, and they're giving me a great big shiny new e-learning project for Christmas. I've never had a project this big before. It's on a topic I know nothing about, and the SMEs are pretty intimidating. Could you please send me a solid plan for my first meeting with the SMEs to make sure that I get back on track right away? Sure. Fine. Well, here we, I have another gift for you as a, as a really useful white paper. Um, and it's, what it's called is the five analysis questions, you know, the most important ones you'll ever ask. Because you know, that's really what has to happen right at the very beginning of a new project, is how you get 
people's expectations built can really be a great way to jumpstart it. And you know, some of the things that you need to do is really get people focused off of the content and onto performance. So asking things you know, very specifically and making this the focus of your initial meetings is what do you really expect learners to be able to do when they're completing this? Um, too often your initial meetings are just about content dumps. Um, and also talk about what are the real consequences to the learner if they fail, um, what, how can you actively demonstrate this? What specific performance mistakes are people going to make? And, and you know, sort of what tools and challenges do they have? And I think if you really focus on the doing, and that will lead you into some really cool interactions quickly, you're going to find that there, you have a really great foundation of your project. Um, I think too often people think we need to do all the administrative stuff first. And again, by the time you do that, you just build barriers rather than building you know, excitement about what the possibility is. So I think one of the best things you can do is you know, get this white paper and think about how you can get this analysis to be really useful in getting everybody engaged at the very beginning of your project. And Christopher, we want to give a shout out to you. Thank you so much for your question for the education market. We'll be following up with you separately on that. And Santa, just so you know, we've already had a couple offers come in for you in your um, off-season work. A couple people want you to come on site and do some ASTD e-learning certificate courses for them. So, Santa, oh, you're going to be I, busy. <laughs> I was hoping they were going to want to be come and do a dance demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> They'd like that. So, Santa, just a few more questions for you here with about 10 minutes yeah. left. Dear Santa, so what I'd really like is some help with setting up a project plan. I use a very SAM-like development process. Modeling the plan within project planning software is tricky. The same moving parts that make design and develop more effective make project planning more complex. I'd love to hear some best practices for setting plans up. And that's signed by Mary. And we've got many similar ones. Um, we pulled one from Lori. Dear Santa, I'm a training department of one. We hear that quite a bit, don't we, Santa? Yes. And I'm looking for ways to become more efficient. Any tips? I recently attended a webinar on the SAM process, and I really like how streamlined and efficient it looks, but I'm not sure how that would work without the collaboration portion. Signed, Lori. Yeah, well, you know, this is a big switch. And what SAM is, just for anybody who hasn't heard that term, it means successive approximation model. And it's a, it's a really powerful way to go about structuring your e-learning development. Um, you maybe have heard of things like agile programming development. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's similar in that what it wants you to do is focus on powerful choices and powerful decisions, rapid evaluation, and so you can fix things. Now, of course, it's always much easier to have a team, but as Laurie points out, sometimes you're a training department of one. Um, but what you need to do is actually realize that you have lots of hats that you're a project manager, that you're a designer, that you may be a graphic artist, you may be a developer, you may be a user testing person. And sometimes those goals um, con conflict. And what it requires of you is discipline to figure out how can I continue to really um, switch these responsibilities. And in fact, it's a lot easier to do in the SAM process than to do in the old ADDI process to, when you have to do all of this because um, what I've found is a lot of times you get st stuck in a rut because you're doing one thing for so long that it's hard to switch. Um, in SAM, things are a lot more dynamic, that you'd make smaller choices, that you're able to um, have all, all those perspectives um, present all the time. You know, psychology says we can't multitask, um, but we, we switch serially very quickly. And what you need to do with Sam, if you're doing this by yourself, is just be very intentional about making sure that you are um, putting on a creative hat and then putting on a critical hat and putting on an analytical hat um, and being able to work together that way. Now, um, so there's a, um, if you want to read more about that, there is a really great book that's a big seller for ASCD called Leaving Addy for Sam. And that has project plans, some specific examples, and there's going to be some um, workbooks coming out this year that will also help give some, um, uh, 
some tools that will help you figure out how to do that. Um, it's not as hard as it looks. I think we just have to be willing to release some of those prejudices that we've built over the years. Um, and the, the whole idea is do what makes sense when it makes sense to do it, rather than being a victim to what, um, what an antedated process might have suggested. <laughs> oh, there's one of my assistants. He's taking my advice. So you need to do what he's doing. Um, and, and that's a really great book to, to open your eyes to the possibilities of a different way of, of um, managing your product, your projects. You know, and real quickly, what it means is what a successive approximation means is that when you um, start, you sort of evaluate the situation, and but you don't do all of it, but you figure out what's a really key challenge, and let's design a solution. Let's develop it into a prototype so we can actually see what it looks like online, and then we'll ask, is that good enough? And then oftentimes we'll have to say, well, no, that could be fixed. Let's design a few fixes. And this cycle of, you know, that's what I mean by switching your hats, um, but being very quick about not doing any of these things too long that you get wed to a solution that's wrong. Now, when you get this worked into a full process, um, and a, a, if you have a bigger team, you can be a little bit more formal about the phases that you're preparing, and then that design phase happens with a, with um, frequent reviews, and then you switch over into what we call the iterative development phase, which is more about how do you really produce the designs that you've come up with. But so that's a snapshot of what SAM is all about. It's this idea of doing rapid iterations in smaller steps so that you're preventing yourself from going down the wrong road, um, which is one of the things that kills so many projects is with overruns and losing um, schedules because we didn't realize soon enough that we were doing something that wasn't ideal. We have a fun Bye. little, right before we go to our poem, we have a little quiz for everyone online. If you could go into your little chat windows and type what you think CCAF means, because we haven't mentioned it much on this call, but we're about to. And the first one to get in what CCAF means will win a prize. So everybody go to your chat windows and put it in. Sammy, you want to give us the countdown? While people are doing that too, um, we had someone wanting to, us to mention Julie Dirksen's book, um, Design for How People Learn, and Julie is a former um, Alanite, so we love promoting her book as well. So the winner really, is... Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was saying that's a really great book to, to help you as you're designing in, in their interactions. Great. So we have three winners out of the gate, T Tanya Samuels. Robert Langacher and Kira Jones all have context, challenge, activity, and feedback. So yay to you, and we'll get you some gifts. We have a little poem to share, Santa, that your, your elves were busy yeah, coming up with. Yeah, read that for us, Lisa Pingle? Perfect. It was the night before course launch when all through the firm, all creatures were stirring, our team in full squirm. The files were loaded in the LMS with care in hopes that when posted, the learners would be there. But the learners were nestled all snug in their beds, dreaming anything but learning, indeed anything instead. My boss needing ROI and learner engagement for me had just settled down to wait and to see. In truth, the learners would be snoring when even awake, as our course was so boring, we wouldn't even take. Feeling hopeless and lost, seeking what should we do, knowing learners wouldn't read a word when they could just click right through. When out of my funk, I remember the CCAF model. I sprang from the bed and went in full throttle. Away to the window, I flew like the flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the crest of a new fallen snow gave context and meaning to all found below. Yes, context is a framework and does provide meaning. It's with them for learners they all will be beaming. With context, I'll add challenge, a stimulus to act. The learners will love it. They'll never look back. Context and challenge are good, but activity is needed. That's what learners want. They've begged and they've pleaded. Context, challenge, and activity are all great, but learners are seeking. Just how do I rate? They need feedback, both immediate and delayed, judging how did they do on decisions just made. So when I meet an obstacle, I'll know what to do. Now with CCAF, you will too. Now get to your work and your learner's delight. Happy course launch to all, and to all a good night. 
Well, thank you, Lisa. That's such a funny poem. Um, a good way to capture the, the, the challenge and the excitement of, of getting e-learning right. Now, it was just a pleasure to spend the time with you all this year, and uh, thank you for your letters. Um, we love to get those, and we love to um, try to come up with solutions. So I hope in this short time we were able to offer a few bits of advice that you can take to heart and apply. Um, I really hope you go and get some of those gifts off the Allen Interactions website. They're um, very short ways to get some powerful information. Um, and so as we leave, you hope you have great holidays and stay warm and look for us flying through the air. Uh, Santa, can we get a big ho, ho, ho? Ho, 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 ho. <laughs>